Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again for joining me here at the ABA Division for Public Education social media channels. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by longtime ABA Supreme Court preview author, Professor William W. Berry III, the Montague Professor of Law at the University of Mississippi. Professor Berry, it is a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you for having me. Um, so you write on a wide variety of topics uh, for preview and elsewhere, uh, and including most relevant to what we're going to discuss today, sports law and a little bit of employment law and antitrust law sprinkled in there on top. As we know, uh, at the end of March, the NCAA was front of mind for most uh, college football or basketball fans with the men's and women's tournament ending, but also surprisingly front of mind for many lawyers who follow the Supreme Court. Uh, the court heard argument on March 31st in a consolidated set of cases, the NCAA versus Elston and the ACC versus Elston. Professor Berry, can you tell us a little bit about the background of these cases and how uh, some cases about college athletes ended up before the Supreme Court. Sure. So college sports has always been amateur. And the idea of amateurism means I pay, I play, but I don't get paid for playing for my university. Um, but college athletes have been getting paid for years in terms of their education. So universities pay tuition, room, board, books, and now cost of attendance to college athletes for playing um, but in the last 10 to 20 years, the amount of money from March Madness and from college football has grown to epic proportions. These have become multi-billion dollar industries. And so for years, people have been saying, wait a second, shouldn't the athletes be getting some of this money that they're bringing in? They're bringing in a billion dollars to the school. I mean, and they're getting the tuition, room, board, and books. So maybe over a couple of years, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars. But compared to the billions that are flowing in, there's this outcry, we should get paid more. Um, it's interesting, what do the universities do with that money? That money goes to fund all the other athlete scholarships in sports that aren't on TV as much, um, but also goes to pay the coaches salaries, which are starting to get very, very high, um, multi-million dollar contracts, even for assistant coaches, and for facilities, for these athletic stadiums, for the Taj Mahal type locker rooms, um, and so again, there's this ongoing outcry, and this is where this case comes from, um, for this outcry of let's pay the athletes, let's give them pay to play. So is the challenge before the court whether or not colleges can directly pay athletes? And, and what's the restriction on competition that we're seeing here that puts this into the antitrust world? Um, so where this case comes from is a case involving Ed O'Bannon, um, who sued for use of his name, image, and likeness. The NCAA had sold his images to a video game company. Um, and that case evolved into an antitrust class action. The name, image, and likeness is, you know, someone's ability to go out in the marketplace and get money for use of their images or their video or their YouTube channel or whatever. Um, but that case morphed into an antitrust challenge saying that all the universities in the country had gotten together through the NCAA and restricted the market for athletes. So athletes can't go out and get paid by the University of Alabama or University of Tennessee or Ole Miss in terms of to play because the market has been restricted and it's been limited to those categories I mentioned earlier, amateurism, tuition, room, board, books, um, and cost of attendance. And so that's the restraint of trade. Um, and it clearly violates antitrust law, at least in the first part of what's called the rule of reason test. Um, so there, there's a three-part test that we look at to try to figure out, does this violate antitrust law? So the first part is, is there a restraint in the marketplace? Um, and there is with respect to how much these athletes get paid. It's a salary cap, essentially. But under the rule of reason, you can have a justification as long as it's pro-competitive um, that will allow you to make that kind of restraint. Um, so the idea is if you make the restraint in a different market to promote competition in another market, then it's okay under antitrust law. So what the NCAA will say is we're restricting the amount of money that college athletes are making so that college sports stays college sports and it has its own place in the marketplace. If we paid the athletes, college sports would become indistinguishable from post pro sports and no one would want to watch it anymore our product would lose money in the marketplace. Um, and so that's the NCAA's argument is 
amateurism justifies their restraint. And so this unique product of college sports is what justifies us doing this. Well, the Ninth Circuit below accepted that in part, but not in whole. So they said that may be a legitimate justification, but the way you're restricting things goes too far. So in the O'Bannon case, they said the athletes could get cost of attendance. In Austin, the case that's actually before the court now, they said college athletes can get anything, quote unquote, related to education. So now athletes, if the, if the plaintiffs win in the Austin case, will be able to get computers, will be able to get graduate school tuition, will be able to get summer abroad and postgraduate internships, all things that are quote unquote related to education. So we've got this idea that college sports are something special and the, the unique nature of the, them being amateurs really adds value to the product. We have this sort of technical rule of reason, antitrust standard coming out of it. And then we kind of have this split hybrid ruling out of the Ninth Circuit that allows for educational expenses, but not non-educational expenses. Um, what did the justices do with this when they when they got it in March? What, what happened at oral argument? So it's really interesting. The, the point of the NCAA, I think, in appealing this case was to try to get the Supreme Court to essentially give the NCAA an antitrust exemption, to say that your product is so unique, it's so special, plaintiffs can't bring these kinds of cases, and to kind of shut the door on that. The conservative justices, when they questioned Seth Waxman, the NCAA's lawyer, largely rejected that idea. They pointed at different aspects of the amount of money that's flowing into college sports to say, this really isn't about amateurism, and this really isn't a legitimate justification for what you're doing. Um, interesting, Seth Waxman made a nuanced antitrust argument that I think um, could get traction if they do decide to rule in the NCAA's favor, which is that the NCAA gets to define what its product is. And so that is a, sort of a new idea. Usually the consumer would decide what the product is and what products they want to spend their money on. But he's saying we're unique, NCAA gets to define its product. And if we can define our product in a certain way, that means antitrust law doesn't apply to us, essentially is, is what he's arguing. Um, on the flip side though, the justices also seemed worried about the extent to which this is perpetual litigation. So if we say co educational costs are okay, where does that stop? When is the next lawsuit? And it's sort of the slippery slope idea that we're gonna to continue to have lawsuits until we get to the point that college athletes are able to be in a free market. Interestingly, Justice Sotomayor asked um, Jeffrey Kessler, who's the plaintiff's lawyer at oral argument, are you asking for a bigger remedy than what you had in the court below? Because it seemed like Justice Kagan and Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Alito might even be open to having a bigger remedy here and saying, you know, amateurism isn't a legitimate justification and let's have an open market for college athletes. Um, but the counsel for the plaintiff said no, that he was really just sticking with the educational related benefits that the appellate court, the Ninth Circuit had affirmed. Professor Berry, was there anything interesting or unexpected at oral argument? I think the hostility to the NCAA's mm -hmm. amateurism narrative, I think when the courts had been open to that in the past, I think was a little surprising for some. Um, I, to me, that was one of the interesting takeaways from the oral argument. Um, but, and I think the other thing that was a little surprising is the unwillingness of the, the plaintiffs to want to push further when the court seemed, at least a couple of justices seemed open to that in, by their questions. Yeah, I thought it was interesting when you saw Justice Thomas really bring in the idea of the contracts that the, the coaches get and, and how does that impact the amateur status. And, and I think you're spot on that, that there was some hostility there to that claim for sure. Right. And interestingly, the coaches brought a claim years ago when the NCAA had tried to restrict the assistant basketball coach's salary, um, the, the, the graduate assistant basketball coach. And in a case called Law versus NCAA, um, I think it was the, the 10th Circuit said, no, that violates antitrust law. And so the answer, I think, to Justice Thomas's point, why are the coaches getting paid so much? Because there's no restriction. They on them. can. They absolutely can. Yeah. Professor Berry, if I can ask you to put on your prediction hat for a moment, what do you think when we get our uh, decision in this case, probably in June, um, it, what, what is it gonna look like? So I think it could go either way. Um, my guess though, is probably that the court affirms what the Ninth Circuit does because it splits the difference here. 
it doesn't give an open market to the college athletes. Cause I think the worry is once you do that, then college sports just becomes pro sports. And what is the difference? Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's that hostility towards NCAA. So I think, you know, the Ninth Circuit's result is one that at least seems consistent with, you know, balancing the antitrust law um, the best I think the court can in the situation. The other interesting piece of this though, is there's one more aspect, which is the name, image, and likeness stuff that's going on that, that bears mentioning. So when O'Bannon originally brought his case, that's what he was arguing. There should be no restrictions on the use of name, image, and likeness. And the Ninth Circuit said, no, it's fine for the NCAA to restrict that. So the California legislature passed a law saying as of 2023, that all college athletes can use their name, image, and likeness without restriction. A number of other states have followed and Florida's statute, along with New Mexico's, which was just passed last week, both go into effect on July 1st. Wow. And so you're gonna have the court case coming down presumably in June, the state statutes taking effect in July. And I think the ultimate question is, can the NCAA ride this out and, and survive? That, I think to me, that's the really interesting question in all of this. Well, Professor Berry, thank you so much for joining us today and walking us through this pretty technical case um, that, that could have some big implications as you just outlined for us. Um, I hope we can have you again on our channels to, to talk about the decision once it comes out and uh, any future cases that you write for us as well. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me too. Thank you very much, Kathy.